Hello there everybody and welcome to a new video for Age of Wonders 4. This one is containing 10 advanced tips and tricks for the high culture, helping you out to get your foot into the door with these guys once you have understood the basic mechanics. So I'm going to go over various things that cover the culture in a grand total and timestamps are down below as usual. Let's get started with number one. I want to put an emphasis on the crazy early game potential of this faction. You can awaken your units. The fun part about awakening is that you gain plus four damage on your base attacks due to that. Everybody can get awakened. It is not exclusive to the high culture. You can practically smack that buff on top of every unit and they deal four damage more. This is interesting and so far as this means that your baseline units deal 4 damage more actually and it's quite easy to fix that up. You have a spell right from the get go to apply that on the battlefield. You usually start or you can quite easily start with a couple of supporters who have that as a skill. Your heroes can learn that. All in all you can crank up the damage of your faction super easy and that makes it really really hard to deal with you early on. As soon as you hit tier 2 and you have access to the Sun Priests and the Daylight Spears, basically all you need is a smidge of extra damage from a tome like Pyromancy, Cryomancy, Evocation, add wherever you can a unit enchantment that boosts up the damage of your troops, and your roster is massive early on, due to just the Awakening bonus. So don't sleep on that, you can force early wars against free cities with that if they just settle on a spot that's just not to your liking or something like that. It's quite easy to overrun enemies by playing this card smartly and don't forget that you have quite powerful supporters which have a pretty heavy burst heal. It's only single target but 30 HP are a lot. So use that wisely and you can have a really really good early game with the high culture completely regardless of your um, build that you're following because even if you chose a defensive tome early on the awakening bonus adds in so much damage to your troops that you won't have really a hard time keeping up the damage early on but it falls off later so let's talk about number two i want to talk a bit about the alignment agenda of this faction and what this means for you so the high culture is all about choosing one alignment and implementing that into your playstyle. Once we hit pure good, we gain a lot of city stability for free in our cities. The neutral playstyle is playing with city stability, so the more city stability we have um, in, the, uh, in our cities, the more food and production we gain as long as we are neutral. This is, by the way, your, pretty much your natural state of mind, because pure good and pure evil, you have to work quite hard for that. This means your cities grow even more productive by city stability than other species. This is something really to know and to use, because it means if your cities are happy, they build fast and they expand fast. So this is pretty much most of the time the case. What that means in a nutshell, pure good is really good for playing just with a low amount of cities and putting a lot of uh, weight on top of these because you gain a lot of city stability. Or you can just use it in general to make your cities more productive. Neutral is extremely good if you want to have a lot of cities by keeping them happy there's a lot of methods of doing that, magic, buildings, whatever. You make them grow insanely fast. If your strategy is a expansionistic one, you can utilize that to fortify your cities extremely fast while claiming provinces like crazy. So you can use that really, really well for an expansionistic playstyle, but you will need city stability to do so. And the pure evil playstyle, well, I gotta say it's quite underwhelming because your units only start combat in awakened state. That means you have three turns where your entire army is awakened and then poof, it's gone and you have to reapply Awakening manually again. Compared to the other alignment bonuses, I feel like that it's, it's a bit underwhelming, but if you have a Blitz tactic where you really want to hit the enemy hard in the very first three turns, this is highly synergistic. But again, you have to work for it, and you should optimize your strategy towards it. But don't think that this is permanent evil awaken, uh, permanent awakening by that. I really hope that this pot gets a buff at some point because I feel like it is not nearly as powerful as the other things, but maybe I'm playing it wrong. Enough about that, let's get into number three, 
I want to talk a second about your crazy strong tier one archers. So you have a insane archer synergy on this faction because of this. So seeking missiles is one trait that activates the moment they are awakened. So your archers not only gain a lot of damage when they are awakened, they also gain range. That means add just one more damage enchantment on top of that, you have already a really, really powerful unit. Add two or three unit enchantments that are aimed towards ranged units, and you can just have an entire playstyle focused around that, where your main backbone is just archers. They are that good. They can kill tier 5 units if you enchant them properly and play around them. So they are really, really versatile, and it's paying off to, to utilize them well, or at least don't sleep on them because they are really cool units that have due to the awakening mechanic a lot of range a lot of damage a lot of accuracy and they're just uh, extremely good for a tier one unit okay enough about that let's get on over to number four i want to talk about the city stability and how you play it so i already mentioned that you have a lot of city stability available with these guys you can either force a lot of city stability just by being pure good or you want to have it but luckily you can also generate stability in a way that nobody else can because you have access to a very interesting building and it's the solar nexus so I find it in so far extremely intriguing as it gives you city stability for mid and late game stats because everybody loves mana and research, right? I personally do. So this means with this building, all your magic efforts turn into city stability. And to add some icing on the cake, you have always access to the Sun Shrine, which is automatically synergistic with this little thing. And overall, research posts are something that your culture loves quite a lot. So that means it totally pays off in this culture one way or another to aim for a playstyle, tomes or or spells or or pretty much a, a strategy that utilizes city stability in one way or another because either you want a lot of it or you can generate a lot of it. Either way, you should use that. This is a resource that can be utilized with several tomes. There's uh, tomes that give you more stability for the neutral alignment. There's tomes that eat stability, like uh, there's some um, evocation in the uh, in the astral area, a tome that gives you more research at the expense of city stability. Such things are tools that the high culture can wield super easily. So stability is important for this culture. They can play really good around this little thing and I didn't find it as obvious as it should be for these guys. Just want to point out if you weren't aware of it. The thing is, city stability makes your cities way more productive. And this is something which is really, really useful. And therefore, use that. So, number five. I want to have a word about the military roster and shock units for the high culture. So, the high culture's roster is very narrow. They have... On all of their native units, some kind of dormant trait, which makes them even more powerful if they are awakened. But basically, any other unit that is awakened only gets the damage bonus, but not the uh, dormant bonus. Why am I all telling this to you? Because this faction or culture is so highly synergistic with shock units, it's amazing. The ability to just switch off one unit's uh, defensive mode or retaliation attacks gives you the opportunity to just unload tons of damage by your melee units and it's just so useful for the early game or even for the later stages of the game to have some shock units for excess. Their downside is they will never have a dormant trade but I feel or I, I felt in every one of my games like it was so useful to add at least at some point one access point for shock units into my roster just to have access to burst down single targets because it's sometimes sometimes i feel like the base roster of this faction is a little bit lacking in that department they're really good at aoe and such things but single target burst is not their strongest menu so number six i want to talk about buff synergy and support synergy in this faction you start out with 
tactical spells, you have Warding Blessing. It's a healing and a resistance booster. You get to heal your units just right from the get-go. It's also quite cost efficient. Normal costs are 10. And the Awaken Inner Radiance is a one hex awakening spell. That alone is really massive, but if they are awakened already, they gain strengthened instead. So it is also working as a steroid for already awakened units. So you have already buff spells at your disposal. And then you get a, a later down the road access to the Sun Priests, which have more awakening, more healing. And overall, I felt like since your tier 3 unit is a battle mage on top of being also a awakener, it pays off to go for a strategy that aims for supporters and battle mages because you are really good at that. You already have lots of buffing and it doesn't hurt to smack even more buffing capabilities in your tome assortment into that because this is just amazing to have um, a ton of healing or however you want to play it, utilizing their buff specialization into even more buffing goes really well it doesn't depend which element of tomes you pick it just works out so darn well because you already have lots of resilience in your base mainframe and you can expand that in very very interesting ways so that's that number seven i want to talk about the dormant powers a little bit more in detail and what that means for your roster so dormant powers are on every one of your native units so shield units gain more resilience ranged units the arches and the um battle mages share the same trait have range and a courtesy bonus the priests get to inflict a ranged flanked debuff which is really amazing and last but not least, your spear units gain a, another charge of retaliation attack. So that means the strongest stuff that you can pull off is utilizing the dormant traits in your roster. And everything which is not having dormant traits is sadly more not as powerful as other things. Th this means you have a pretty narrow roster. Luckily, I already mentioned it in number five, adding in shock units, it has always fixed for me the case, but in this point I want to talk about, it pays off so much to just orient yourself to add more units that utilize these dormant traits. Try to stick to your high culture path as good as you can, and you will notice how much power up this is in the long run. Especially with the increased range on these units, you can do a lot of shenanigans. You can put up entire flanking builds just with a flood of supporters. It works better than I thought. Or a retaliation build around, centered around the spears and the high resilience of the shields works also quite amazing. But either way, it is important that you don't stray away from the high culture path too much because this will really dilute your power. But it is okay to go for a smidge of some extra power to just mitigate some of your excess problems, like I said. But it is one thing that will always haunt your military playstyle that you have less units available than other people, in my opinion at least. So, number eight, I want to talk about how darn well you are fitted for a vassalization playstyle. So vassals are amazing, they share their income with you and the better uh, their allegiance is, the more they share. And the best part about it is you are natively into order affinity. That means you gain access to all these traits that play along vassals so good. So this is something you just get by being high culture. You just have to add one or two order tomes, which are, in all honesty, highly synergistic with your baseline roster anyway. You have a good access to extra whispering stones, more vassal income, better results from the vassal of the, uh, from the rally of the liege, and all those things. And the best part is, if you opt into shadow attack bit, you grow into a vassalization powerhouse because they have so useful skills for vassal playstyle. You gain knowledge for um, vassals with whispering stones. You gain an extra whispering stone. It, uh, where was it? There are also 
here you can also steal tribute from other empires vassals so this is just so synergistic and it is really really hard to keep up with you if you go for this path so high culture is innately very synergistic with this playstyle of vassalization due to that and uh, it's quite a lot of fun to play that and due to the way that age of wonders 4 works you can always create vassals by conquering the enemy cities and then turning them into uh, free cities. This is such a nice mechanic because this means that there will be always room for some free cities if you want to found them. So use that if it is fitting to your playstyle, that is. So number nine, I want to talk about what sucks about Awakening and what you can do about it. So the thing about Awakening is, you know, it is actually on the outside super simple. Your supporters have awakening as their uh, as a free action, and your awakeners even get twin awakening as a free action, and then they can do their thing after they awaken somebody. Cool, isn't it? So two things. First off, this is one of the most micro intense things that I played in Age of Wonders so far, and I thought the industrious culture was already micro intense. If you want to play around your awakenings properly and efficiently, you will be in for a lot of planning. Not only because you have never enough awakening potential, unless you are willing to spend your tactical slot for an awakening a radiance thing, there are other things that will plague you. For instance, the twin awakening, the another non-awakened unit with, within two hexes is widely random. You cannot really control who's being awakened at the second part. This is not really bad, but you will notice at some points, you will just notice that it goes to the wrong person. And these are all tiny little things that aren't too obvious at the very first glance, but awakening is a very micro-intense thing. So, things I found to alleviate that. Your heroes are all able to learn awakening, you know? they can learn this twin awakening thing so really use it it is that good to have your heroes available on this front as well it eased the burden a lot if this is not available for you you can either use a lot of battle mages to have a lot of twin awakening available this really works well or another thing that worked out for me well was putting more support units into my banners that i'd act than i'd actually do usually my banners only include one support unit per per banner here i often went quite well with a distribution of 50 to 33 33 to 50 percent of supporters in my banners because they are just that good in this faction you will never grow bored of having heals and quite high damage if you build it correctly so awakening is a nuisance in my opinion after playing High Culture now for, I don't know, a dozen or 15 hours or so in total, I really felt like this was one of the things that um, I didn't like the most because combat can be quite tedious, but it is a massive steroid. So I just wanted to point it out what that it is a thing. And the easiest way to mitigate that is to spam the tactical spell because it's the only one hex radius uh, source of awakening that you got. So. But it locks your battle com your, your battle casting slot, so it really sucks at that end. So, either way, either you spend a lot of time micromanaging your awakenings, or you just accept that you have not much uh, tactical com casting capability. This is one bullet you have to catch. Okay, so let's get on over to the last point on my list: one weakness and how to counteract on it. So, the thing is. Your front line is weak. That is because your shield unit is tier 1. That means their base HP and their base stats are relatively low. And your other unit in the defensive roster is also only tier 2. While this is all pretty okay, this makes your front line extremely susceptible to burst. That means it's really easy to lose an entire stack of Dawn Defenders if your enemy happens to be just uh, going into magical damage, for example, then you can easily lose an entire stack. That means you have to keep an eye out on that. Either buff up the stats of your units to make them capable to withstand the blows of the middle late game, or 
you just go into your tome library and you opt into heavier defensive units, iron golems, for example, or entwined protectors. There's lots of shield units of higher tiers that you can recruit for this purpose. But if you, or you just go for some uh, racial enchantments, I go to the out of the nature section, there's lots of options. But if you don't, you will notice that sometimes you can be just cracked so easily because you might have all the heals and buffs in the world but if your stack just dies completely during the enemy turn you will either have to have resurrection tactics which is also totally probable but uh it really means that you have to keep an eye out for that so methods that i found quite useful to counteract that i already mentioned that buffing resilience or hp is a thing but throw away summons were also a thing like for example conjuration spells that just work on the battlefield you just smack a couple of them in front of the enemy and uh, let them soak up the burst this of course works well with the hero skills you often get an offer uh, get these offered and these are really highly synergistic because your frontline can just melt in the first turns quite easily when there's a lot of shock troopers and stuff slamming into the front lines this is something that you have to take care of out up until the mid and late game because this is uh, one major weakness that I noticed in several playthroughs so far even if I played a highly enchanty uh, buffing playstyle these guys just keel over so fast you'll have to work around that okay so there was surely more to say and surely more things to add I'm working on more content of course at all points so let me know what you think in the comment section below add in things that you think that i might have forgotten i'd be really really grateful if you did so a thumbs up on that video or a subscription would make me extremely happy as well if you'd be so kind i'd really really say thanks and yeah there's a playlist down there leading to all the other age of wonders 4 info videos that i did so if you are out for a binge go knock yourself out and a big thanks to the supporters old and new of the channel i really really appreciate you guys you are so amazing in your support not only not only monetary but also uh in the in the in the morale way i really appreciate you guys and uh check out the links down there if you'd be so kind and either way thanks for hanging out to this in this video until the very end i know you guys you obviously watch these videos until the very end and i really like that have a nice day and hopefully see you soon.